Good morning, everybody. Welcome back for this uh, new colloquia from the Instituto de Astrofísica de Andalucía in Granada, in Spain. And today we will have the talk by Dr. Yanis Liodakis from the University of Turku and the Finnish Center of Astronomy with ESO. And he will talk about the X-ray polarimetry, a new window to the universe. So Dr. Liodakis will be introduced by uh, Pepe Vilches. Okay, thank you, René. Good morning, everyone. So it's my pleasure to introduce you, Yanis uh, Liodakis. Welcome. Thank you. Carlos Revisa. Carlos Revisa. Uh, our speaker today is uh, from the University of Turku. You say he presented his PhD in 2017 at the University of Crete. Uh, in the well, the institute there in the within the whole uh, organization. Then he moved for a postdoc at the Cali Institute for Particle Physics and Cosmology at Stanford University. And uh, he's uh, working now, well, during his career, he has been appointed with, uh, you have been doing many, <laughs> in many locations, I would say, with different visits in many uh, top centers of astronomy. And also, you have been awarded several prizes I have seen from your CV and uh, awards, and so you are very active. And then uh, now we have been, for instance, in the universe, uh, New York University, in the, in the Korea Astronomy and Space Science Institute, in the Masculine Institute for Their Astronomy, among other places. So uh, now we have the, uh, the talk of today, is gonna be on the X-ray polarimetry and the new window, wind, wind, window to the universe, but uh, his research topics focus on multi-message emission of jets and supermassive black holes, uh, the structural elements, tidal yeah. moments, radio galaxies, gravitational density, supermassive black holes, etc. So uh, thank you very much for being here. I know your agenda is uh, <laughs> very tight. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much for uh, for the kind introduction and for, for inviting me to tell you about some very exciting results. Uh, from, as already mentioned, a very new window to the universe. So before I start, first of all, let me tell you that feel free to stop me at any time and ask uh, questions. And second, uh, what I'm gonna be showing you is not uh, my work, but there is a large group of people uh, that you can find in this, in this URL that have uh, really worked tirelessly over the past few years to make uh, everything happen. So, that new window to the universe uh, with uh, X-ray polarization <coughs> started on the 9th of September in 2021 when NASA launched the first X-ray polarimeter, which is the Imaging X-ray Polarimeter Explorer. And what we see here is the trajectory of the Falcon rocket that took us to our equatorial orbit about 500 kilometers from uh, the ground. And this is the exact moment that IXP, which at the time is about the size of a fridge, is released into its orbit. And you see sort of the flap thing here that are popping out. Those are the solar panels that automatically activate. And about a minute and a half later, the spacecraft made contact with the ground station in Singapore. And uh, if you've never been involved with a space mission before, let me tell you that that is the exact moment where everybody started breathing again normally. Uh, it goes into a much more dangerous phase in its commissioning after that, but you don't really feel uh, too bad about that. So it took us basically a full month for the spacecraft to deploy uh, all its systems, start up everything, align mirrors, calibration, and all that. And science observations started in January or late January of 2022. So you might be wondering why do we even bother with um, X-ray polarization or polarization in general. And the reason is that the universe is much more polarized than you might think. And there are many ways that you, we can create polarization. You can sort of group them into two broad categories. One is you can have magnetic fields. And for that, we have what's called non-thermal processes. And the most common of those is uh, singleton radiation. So basically magnetic fields give a preferred direction of emission, and that gives rise to polarized light. And as you can see, there are plenty of interesting uh, objects that can make synchrotron uh, emission. 
After I made this slide, I realized that I've only put black holes there. Uh, that's a bias because this is what I study, as you as you've heard. But I assure you, there are plenty of other objects, not not black holes, that make signature radiation. The other way is geometry, and geometry has to do with some sort of scattering. And again, the most common process that can induce polarization is Thompson scattering. And basically, you get some preferred plane of scattering. For example, if you're looking at an accretion disk, that defines sort of a, a you know where all your scattering will happen, and that will preferentially polarize light in, in some direction. One of the very interesting applications that I heard about recently has actually to do with exoplanets, which is what we see here. So basically, if you have a transiting planet, then you can scatter light in the atmosphere of that planet, and that will give you a small rise of the polarization. And then if you measure sort of the uh, wavelength dependence of that polarization, you might be able to infer the composition of the planet, uh, planet's atmosphere, which I thought was very cool. As you can imagine, the signal for that is tiny. We're talking about 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5. But that's just so to tell you that we're now reaching a point where our instruments are getting sensitive enough for those kind of science cases. So I think polarization will play a much more uh, important role in the coming years in all our science efforts. Now, how would you even measure polarization? Well, in our laboratories here on Earth, or even in our optical telescopes, you can use filters or some birefringent material or uh, some Hubble plate, and you basically measure the intensity of the light in different polarization directions. And by combining them, you can measure what is the, we call the degree of polarization, so that how much of your light is polarized, and the polarization angle, which is, which is the direction of that polarized emission. At high energies, which I'll be telling you about, things are a little bit more different. And they're, in fact, the reason why it's sort of lagging behind the lower energy. So we've been measuring radio and optical polarization for decades now. It's only you know, since last year that we can actually do it with some uh, efficiency. So there are different ways that you do. You measure polarization, at, which are sort of tailored to different energies. I have here photoelectric absorption because this is a you know, low energies, and that is more relevant to, to IXP, but it doesn't really matter. The principle of it is, is the same throughout uh, energy. So you will have the high energy photon will enter your detector. It will interact somehow in that detector and will create secondary particles. And then it's the secondary particles that carry the polarization information of the incoming light. And it is, in fact, the azimuthal scattering distribution of those particles that if it's the light is polarized, it will follow uh, this distribution, which is described by a cosine square theta. And then if you measure sort of the amplitude of those peaks and where the trough is, then you can recover the polarization uh, degree and angle. If your light is unpolarized, then all scattering angles have the same probability. So then you will just get a flat, uh, a flat line. So this is what IXP looks like in, in all its glory. Uh, it is a small NASA mission. That means that we have a two-year nominal lifetime, which ends in December of this year, but we've already been extended for 20 months until the uh, NASA senior review. And given the uniqueness of the mission, and as you will see in a minute, uh, its success, it's not unlikely that the mission will continue for many years to come. Uh, it has three identical uh, detectors, which are oriented slightly differently with respect to each other, and that helps us take out any spurious polarization signal, and they're operating in the 1 to 10 uh, kV range. 2 to 8 is really our sensitivity, but we're trying to sort of uh, widen the, um, the energy range to, to its nominal uh, level. So what is happening? Uh, is that you get an X-ray that will enter your detector. In the case of IXP, that's just a gas chamber. And that will be absorbed. It will create photoelectrons. Then your signal is amplified at what's called the GEM. It's the gas electron multiplier. And then projected onto the pixel anode in 2D. And that would create what we call an electron trap, which is what you see here. 
So the blue point is where the X-ray is absorbed in your detector. And the blue line is the initial direction of the, those photoelectrons. So we need to, for every of this photon, we need to create an, an electron track, get thousands uh, and thousands of those, create that uh, azimuthal scattering distribution, and from that, try to recover the polarization information. We cannot do it with a single photon, uh, of course. And as you can imagine, the real challenge is to being able to figure out that direction um, accurately. Uh, now we're using what's called the moment analysis, where you try to find the barycenter of the track and from that sort of recover that original direction. We've been experimenting with uh, machine learning tools, and those, in fact, seem to do much better. And we can get an improvement of up to 25% in, in the energy ranges. Please. Yeah, sorry, since you said we could interrupt. So just to take it here, because I come from the infrared values, whatever polarization, Wallace and prisms, whatever. So basically what you do is you have, you don't need to have any grid or anything, any, any array. So you just, it's basically the polarization direction of the X-ray photon. So the electric field accelerates the, electrons the, into a the certain photo area, electric. And that's how you recover it. Yeah. Okay, thanks. The, <laughs> you make it sound easy. <laughs> it's <laughs> not really. <laughs> But yeah, that, that, that's the principle. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's but fine. it's the principle. It's yes, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> far less trivial okay. than yeah, yeah. Just, just for, for dummies, because uh, X-ray polarization for dummies are happy with that experiment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So, uh, as I was saying, the, the machine learning tools do much better. Uh, these are not been implemented yet in the standard pipeline, but they are being now mandated by. NASA for the 20 month extension that we got. So there will soon be, be a pipeline uh, for that as well. So this is the very first astrophysical electron track that we ever got. And it comes from a supernova remnant uh, called Cassiopeia A. And we we're fairly lucky that it's such an easy one to, uh, to characterize. And this is what the image of, of Cassiopeia A uh, looks like. So we have seven topical working groups in IXP, which you can see here. Basically, we're looking at everything that is bright in X-rays. And we think, or our model suggested, that those things would be polarized. I can already tell you that we had quite a bit of surprises in our first uh, year and a half. Of course, this is something that you that you want. Uh, you know, if everything goes as, as you plan, it's not really that, that exciting. Uh, so we were happy about those surprises. Um, and as you can see, we've been fairly, fairly productive. Most of the results from the first year are already out, but we have several uh, more papers that are coming up. Uh, I thought I'll just give you a few of the highlights and a few of what at least it's a you know, personal uh, selection of the interesting results that I think we have so far from different, different topics. And then I'll focus a little bit on, on blazers and radio galaxies. Uh, that's because this is where I'm mostly uh, working on, uh, and I'm the coordinator of the, the multi-wavelength follow-up program, and we're uh, very happy that Ivan and his group uh, exist and help us a lot with all our, our efforts. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. But before I do it, uh, some of the results are uh, currently under embargo from the journals, so for the remainder of the talk, please no uh, pictures or social media of any kind because we're going to get uh, in trouble. So let me start by the closest and, and smallest things, and I'll work my way to the, the furthest out and, and big things. And of course, one of the sort of no-brainers uh, brainer sources that we're going to do was the crack. And it's, of course, one of the brightest sources in the sky, but there is also uh, a lot of history here, and um, the crab is the only source that had an actual three, more than three sigma polarization measurement in that energy range from our original PI, which Martin Weisskopf back in 1976. So it was also sort of a matter of pride that we get that uh, observation done again. Uh, and if you do it in the way that was done back in the 70s, uh, we pretty much recover the same results. Uh, which is nice. Of course, 40 years later, we can do much, much better. And IXP is, as the name suggests, an imaging polarimeter. So we can resolve things out. And as you can see here on the left, 
This is the sort of polarized map of, of the Crab Nebula and uh, the shows the polarization degree. And on the right, it shows the polarization angle. So we find that pretty much the post emission seems to be uh, unpolarized, uh, but there is a large scale magnetic field, which seems to be sort of toroidal around the pulsar. And this is pretty much what people would have expected to see in, in this type of, uh, of sources. Another very interesting science case for, for neutron stars is the ones that are very <coughs> magnetized. And we call them magnetars. And uh, we, we think that they have magnetic fields that are around 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15 gaps, which is quite high. And it's high enough for us to starting to see quantum electrodynamic effects. And that was the reason we wanted to study these sources. I mean, uh, particular, we see something, or we hope to see something, it's called quantum birefringence, which is where vacuum starts behaving like a uh, birefringent crystal, and we, it will align the magnetic field on large scales around the neutron star. So what I'm showing you here is the very first observation of such a source. So on the left is what we call the uh, QU plot. So it's the Stokes U versus the Stokes Q. The Stokes parameters are like a just a mathematical description of how we use to measure polarization. So what this is showing you is basically distance from the center gives you the polarization degree, and the location around the circle gives you the polarization angle. That's nothing too, too fancy. So as you can see, the different colors here are the individual detectors in IXP, which we can, of course, combine to get a much better measurement, which is that black dot. And that magenta shaded area, that's what we call the MDP-99. That stands for the minimum detectable polarization at the 99% confidence uh, level. That comes from the instrument. And it basically tells us that above that level, we can be more than 99% certain that our measurement is real and not some fluctuation of, of the background. So as you can see, we've got a pretty good detection of uh, polarization in that source for the integrated, but of course, as I said, we can do better. And apart from the you know special resolution, we also have timing resolution. We can get the phase results as well, which is what you see here on uh, the right. So the top panel shows you the brightness, which seems to have those two peaks. Uh, middle panel shows the polarization degree, which with a little bit of imagination, you can see sort of it following what the, the flux is doing. And that is sort of expected because the polarization degree sort of traces what happens very close to the surface of the neutral star. But then when you look at the polarization angle, we see something completely different. And that yellow line you see, that's what's called vector rotation model. It's when you basically have a magnetic pole swinging around in the neutral star. So that happens because there is a very large scale alignment of the magnetic field around the, uh, the magnetar. So this is exactly what we expect to see from quantum biorefrigents. Unfortunately, the peak polarization that we measure is about 20%. At that level, there are other models that can mimic the same behavior. So it's indicative that we are, in fact, looking at QED effects, but we cannot uh, disfavor the other models that, that strongly. We planned a lot more observations of the sources, so hopefully soon uh, we'll have some more to say about that. Then let me tell you about another very interesting case in that sort of category, and that is the Vila uh, Pulsar. And this is very interesting we, because we see very high degree uh, of polarization. So the integrated is 44%, which is twice as, as much as what we get from the crab. Uh, we don't see any energy dependence. So here's the polarization degree and polarization angle versus energy. And as you can see, everything is, is pretty much consistent within the uncertainties. But what is really interesting is what we're looking at different regions, uh, we find that the magnetic field is sort of aligned with, with the radio jet. But at the top panel, well, the part here, where basically the pulsar wind is pushing into the supernova, the supernova remnant, and we think this is sort of a shot pushing outwards, we see more than 60% polarization. That is at the limit of singleton radiation. So basically, any particle acceleration happening there happens under 
almost perfectly ordered magnetic field with very little turbulence. So this is one of the, the cases where theorists really love when you know, nature gives you the spherical cow approximation. So I'm, I'm sure there'll be a lot, a lot of exciting results about that. So let me now move to uh, black holes. And again, I have to start with sort of the, the small black holes and the systems that we call uh, microquasars. And this is where you have a stellar mass black hole that's in a binary system with usually a massive uh, star. So one of the very famous sources and uh, one of our first surprises is uh, called Cygnus X1. And for that, we measure about the 4% polarization. Now, I've been talking to you about 40 and 60%, so it's, you know, doesn't that seem very high? But our expectations for that was 1% or lower. So we're actually not entirely sure how do we get that high uh, level of polarization. There seems to be sort of an energy dependence to that. So if you restrict yourself in different energy ranges, it would be a, a movement towards higher values, but the uncertainty will increase. So that's not entirely uh, certain. And we also see that the, um, the polarization uh, angle, which is that yellow line, is sort of aligned with the jet axis on um, the plane of the sky. So we know the x-rays from the, that object come from a structure they call the corona, which we don't really know what it is or, or how it's, uh, what's the geometry. So what these results are telling us are that first, that corona has to be sort of extended above the, uh, the accretion disk, and that the accretion disk needs to be perpendicular to the radio jet. Now for the second part, this is something that everybody sort of uh, naively assumes anyway, but it's of course nice always to get independent confirmation. Um, the first part about the geometry of the corona, that was sort of unexpected a little bit and unknown. Our observations were done in what's called the hard state. Uh, that's where the accretion rate of the source is fairly low. Uh, so we can only be talking about that state, but we've planned a few more observations this summer. So hopefully we'll catch it in a different accretion state and we'll see how that geometry changes with the, you know, how the other properties of the source change as well. Another very uh, interesting source, uh, also a microquasar is Cygnus X3. And this time we see the complete opposite behavior. So first of all, we see very high degree of polarization, it's 25%. We see the polarization angle is now perpendicular to the jet. And we also see no energy dependence uh, whatsoever. So again, here's the polarization degree and polarization angle. Uh, we had two observations. There, there seemed to be fairly consistent behavior. There's only a little bit of drop at high energies, where, uh, but we know this is the, where the iron line is. So we sort of expect some contribution from unpolarized emission. So in this case, what we think is happening is that we're actually not looking at the primary source of radiation, but there is sort of a funnel that is around the source and we're looking at it from the side. So basically what we're getting is the backscattering from that funnel and that gives, gives rise to that very high degree of uh, polarization. Now, what is very interesting is that we have some indications of the orientation of the source on the plane of the sky, and then you can try to work out what it would look like from an extragalactic observer looking at it from you know, inside the funnel. And what we're getting uh, is that the luminosity of, in, of the source in different scenarios seems to be uh, super edible. So for somebody in a different galaxy far away, this is a neutral luminous X-ray source. Uh, so that is sort of um, kind of a unique case that we can, if, if it proves to be in to be that, that we can actually use to study uh, ULXs from a completely uh, different perspective. Another very uh, interesting science case, and I think it was one of the big surprises, uh, was this GRB 221009A. Now, the surprise here was not in terms of the results. The surprise was in terms that we were actually able to do that. So. Uh, we never thought that we were able to observe a, a GRB. Uh, the spacecraft is not 
built to point very fast. Our reaction time was thought to be 10 to you know maybe seven days if we push things. Uh, but this was really an exceptional uh, event that made us basically drop everything we're doing and we were on target in uh, 36 hours, which is sort of a record. That's not happened before. I don't think the spacecraft people were too happy about that. So uh, hopefully we'll convince them again uh, next time. So the reason this was a very spectacular event, uh, I'm going to show you in just a minute, but you can get it from its name or nickname better, which because it was called the boat, which is the brightest of all time. And you see here the uh, very nice picture from XMM. And the rings you see there, that is not an instrumental effect. That is literally the interstellar dust that has been set on fire by the, the Jeremy. That's how bright that was. But let me sort of give you some graphical things. So that was the GRB 170817. That's the gravitational wave measure. We know that was sort of off axis or so not very bright. Uh, so these are now different GRBs and you know how in order of brightness, <laughs> the y axis is just count rate. It counts per second in the detector. Um, and now we're like at 80,000. This was the brightest GRB that we knew of. And this is both. And you can see here how it basically dwarfs everything um, in, in comparison. So in 36 hours, we're able to catch a source in what's called the afterglow. That's, uh, you know, after the explosion is basically done and you're pushing shocks out into the interstellar medium. These are snapshots from the IXP observation, which was only about 100 kiloseconds. And uh, we can, as you can see, we can sort of resolve uh, the rings. And the rings basically are the echo from the prompt emission. So we could basically get both afterglow and prompt emission at the same time. Unfortunately, this proven to be a much more tricky analysis. And uh, it's it's really hard to, to come to conclusions. So we cannot really say that much about the prompt emission. Uh, about the uh, afterglow, we got an upper limit of around 12%. At the same time, we had optical polarization from the Nordic Optical Telescope. And so we pushed the limit sort of uh, below 7%. And that still sort of allows us to reject some of based on a you know, standard model for the GRBs. You can reject some uh, parameter space from the opening angles and the viewing angles and, and things like that. Uh, but hopefully the next GRB, if we, if we ever manage to do that, will, will give us Will give us better uh, better results. So let me now move on to uh, the big black holes. And I have to start, of course, with our galactic center, which we were hoping that the results would be out uh, yesterday or today. That was postponed a little bit, but uh, that's OK. So we've known from, from Fermi uh, some time ago now that there are these structures that are going above and, and below the galactic center. And uh, we call them the Fermi bubbles. We don't know exactly where those are coming from. Uh, what we know is that uh, Erosita has seen them now in X-rays and also Planck in in radio. So one of the theories is that these are some sort of outflows, um, or you know, some failed jet or some something that came from when you know the dark days of Sagittarius A star when it was. Uh, basically accreting a lot more matter and it resembled an AGM. So we kind of wanted to test that, that theory. And when you look at the galactic center, there, there's a lot of, it's a very interesting region. There's a lot of things going on there. And there, and you have some uh, giant molecular clouds that seem to be bright in X-rays. And at least my understanding is that there is not really a good explanation why those would be bright in, in X-rays. Uh, but again, one of those theories is that if such a star was accreting a lot more in the past, it would be irradiating those clouds. And we're basically, that X-ray that we observe today is the echo from that past activity. So the prediction is that those X-rays should be polarized. And there is now absolutely no reason why they should be polarized. Other than that, 
and that the polarization angle is would be pointing as uh, you know to Sagittarius A star as the, the source of the incoming scattered radiation. So we have our observations very recently, and you see here on the left, this is the Chandra image that we got, which is in logarithm, so you can see a little bit of the, the diffuse emission as well. And uh, the right shows you what the, you know, the region looks like through, through IXP. So we do in fact observe 31% polarization with 99% confidence, and we do find the polarization angle to be pointing to Sagittarius A star. So based on you know, the level of polarization, the distance of this, this cloud, we think that 200 years ago, roughly, um, our galaxy looked like an AGI, basically. Uh, now, it's not entirely clear whether it was you know, a steady state AGN, like that we know, or it could be some other event. You could have a you know, total disruption or something happening. We know there are stars you know, very close to Sagittarius A star. But we have a few more observations planned for this year, and hopefully we'll be able to say um, a bit more about that. But let me tell you also about you know normal AGM, and I'll start with uh, the uh, what's called radio quiet. That means that the optical is just higher uh, than the radio. It's nothing, nothing again special. And one of the very famous sources, uh, which is an ob obscured AGM. It's a Cipher 2, that means that we're looking at sort of from the side, it's called Cicinus, the Cicinus Galaxy. And uh, you can sort of see here what the uh, the region looks like from Chandra. There is of course a lot of other things and this, the sources have been really marked here are ULXs. Uh, with IXP, we basically get you know, this circle. And so you can see sort of kind of a difference between you know, Chandra's resolution and IXP, but we can use Chandra in, in our analysis to you know, decompose the different spectral models that come into place. So we do find about 28% polarization. And again, the polarization seems to be a line perpendicular to the radio gem. So this is pretty much analogous to Cygnus X3 that I told you about. And basically, we think that there is a torus that's surrounding the, uh, the very inner regions of the black hole. And again, we see the backscattering uh, from that. And of course, this is exactly what we would have expected from the current unification models of, of AGN, where the differences really come from that inclination of the source to, to our line of sight. Now on to the radio loud sources, and we've only done one, and that is uh, Centaurus A. Uh, and you see here how that looks like. So we have the, the core, and that case it means that we're looking like very close to the black hole. We get the jet, and uh, we also get, again, a, a neutral luminous X-ray source in the field of view. Unfortunately, both the ULX and the jet are too faint for us to do any useful uh, polarization inference, but the core is sort of enough. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot get a detection. Uh, again, this was about a 100 kilosecond observation, so not, not very long, but we got a fairly good upper limit, I would say, with anywhere between 6.5 and 8%, depending on the assumptions uh, you make. Uh, but at the same time, we had Swift, New Star, and Integral observe the source, and you can see here the, the very lovely spectrum from 0.3 or the way out to 400 kV. So at higher energies, we see nothing but the power law uh, all the way down. And that is telling us that this is really coming from the jet. At uh, low energies where IXP is looking at, this is a little bit more complicated and they are studies suggesting that this could be thermal emission coming from the corona or the accretion disk. If you're observant enough, you might have noticed this green blip here. Uh, that is the iron K alpha line and that we know is coming from, from the accretion disk. Uh, but nevertheless, if you assume that this is jet emission all of it, or at least jet dominates, then the low degree of polarization tells us that this is most likely some sort of inverse Compton scattering from the relativistic electrons in the jet. If it's thermal emission, then we have some constraints from the inclination of the, of the jet from radio, and that would put sort of the upper limit in the polarization that we would expect to be around 8%, and this is in fact, consistent with, with what we found. 
And finally, uh, let me tell you about my favorite subject, which are blazars. And blazars are when you take the uh, jet of Sydney, which is on the plane of the sky, and you point it directly towards the line of sight. And as you can see, that results in very ugly looking images. Uh, so we basically just see the PSF, the instrument. That happens in almost every instrument we look at. IXP, unfortunately, is not, not an exception. But what I still find is uh, fascinating is the spectral energy distribution laser, which I'm sure you've seen some time, but it's still amazing how it extends from low frequency radio all the way to TV uh, gamma rays. And as you can see, they all sort of have these two broad humps. The second one, which goes from X-rays to, to TV, that is something we don't fully understand. And it's one of the key science objectives that we're trying to figure out now. Uh, so all our second year IXP observations are pretty much tailored to tell us about the origin of that. Even as we speak, we're now observing a source that we hope will, will let us know more about that. So I will not be focusing on that. You will have to invite me again uh, next year. I will tell you about the first one, which we know is singleton radiation from relativistic electrons that have been accelerated in the magnetic field of the jet. What we don't know is how that acceleration takes place. And we have two scenarios for that. One is that we're looking at shocks, and those could be either shocks that are traveling in the jet, or they could be standing shocks. And the alternative is magnetic reconnection. So you have layers of opposite polarity magnetic field lines that will sort of come together and break apart and reconnect, as you see in that animation. And in the regions where that happens, you can efficiently accelerate particles to high energies. So in order to address this question, we need sources that look like this. So basically, all the from radio to X-rays are all part of the, the same hump. So we're looking at the same emission, emission process. So what you're looking here on the right, this is the, the work we did before the mission was launched, trying to select targets for these two years of observation. So the y-axis shows you the expected polarization degree that comes from models. And the x-axis shows you the uh, X-ray flux, which was observed from SWIFT and other satellites. The dashed lines are the IXP sensitivity for different exposure times, and just that the colors give you different subclasses of blazers. So this type of sources are the ones you see here sort of in, in green. And I can already tell you from our first year observations that this diagram has proven to be fairly accurate, both in terms of the prediction, but also in terms of uh, the sensitivity of the instrument, which is uh, pretty much operating nominally. So when the mission was launched, we told the instrument people that 100 kiloseconds allows you to measure X-ray polarization from a carrying type one. And in fact, just a year over uh, ago now, and 100 kiloseconds later, IXP measures X-ray polarization from a supermassive black hole for its very first time in its career, which is what you see here. So we got about 10% polarization that is roughly aligned with the jet axis, which is that magenta shade area. Given that this was the first measurement, we had to sort of make sure that we're not doing something very, very wrong. So two weeks later, we got another measurement. We basically got the same same results again. Another ten percent roughly aligned with the jet axis. Now in blazars, that ten percent doesn't tell us absolutely anything. And we need to put this in the broad, you know, multi wavelength context. So what I'm showing you here is the logarithm of the ratio of the X-ray to optical polarization, and I have plotted the expectations we have from different models, starting with the simplest one, which is what. You know, everybody's using, it's called the single zone model where everything happens very locally in the jet. And we don't really expect any difference in the polarization from optical to X-rays to the more complicated model, which is called the energy stratified, which is that gray shading area where that predicts the mission coming from the entire jet. So that predicts much higher X-ray polarization than the optical. And in fact, we see two and a half times more for the first observation and for the second one, just confirm uh, our results. But uh, thanks to Ivan and his effort here, we also have radio polarization in this case. And what we find is that there's basically an exponential rise of the polarization degree 
as you go from radio to optical to x-ray. There's a, basically a doubling in every, every step. And we also see that the polarization angles all seem to be consistent with each other and aligned with, with the jet axis. So you can write down the expectations we have from the different models and you know, of course, compare that to the observations. And there is in fact, one that satisfies uh, all our observations and that this energy stratified model, but one that's been accelerated, the particles are accelerated in shocks and not in magnetic reconnection regions. This was sort of a model we had actually predicted through optical polarization back in 2016, but at the time we could not differentiate between magnetic reconnection and shocks. So now adding both radio and X-ray polarization, we're able uh, to, to do that. Now you might be wondering, of course, that this is only on one source, what happens with, with the others? And I can already tell you that basically in all our observations after that, we're basically getting the same results. And this is from the second source that we've observed called Macarian uh, 4 to 1, where now we see basically five times the, uh, the X-ray polarization to the optic. Now, Marcan 4, uh, uh, 4 to 1 is a very interesting case for a completely different reason. Now, this is the observation happened in May, and we got about 15% polarization. Everything seemed you know, nice and consistent with our previous results. And then we got another observation, two, in fact, back to back almost with a day gap in June. So when the quick look data comes in, uh, that is basically when the instrument team, you know, gets the data from the spacecraft, they just sum up everything and, and give you a result. And they send an email saying that the source is unpolarized. And that you can imagine being the first months of the mission, that uh, was a little bit concerning. And so it raised a lot of red flags. People started panicking a little bit because we might be, you know, something would be happening that we were doing and was everything was completely wrong. But we very soon realized that basically what the quick look analysis is doing is over the few days of observations of Ubi XP, uh, it assumed that everything is constant. And uh, if instead the polarization angle is changing throughout this, this observation, then you end up averaging over different polarization states and you will cancel out any polarization. And in fact, we were observing the first X-ray polarization angle uh, rotation, which is what we see here. So these are the phenomenon that we basically see only in blazars. We don't really have indication it happens in other sources. And until very recently, we only knew this is happening in, in optical. And quite frankly, we don't fully understand what, what, is, what is happening, but what we know now from all our multi-wavelength campaign, which is what you see here, especially the bottom panel shows the polarization angle, radio, optical, and infrared are all constant doing absolutely nothing. And while X-rays are rotating more than 300 degrees. So it's really going sort of in, in circles. So, and that is pretty much consistent with, with this energy stratified model because the emission regions are not cospatial. Something that happens in X-rays takes time to sort of propagate down the jet and move uh, you know, further into the optical. So that really gives us an opportunity to sort of study how the structure of the jet in, in really, uh, really detail. Unfortunately, uh, if we knew, we would have kept observing in optical and maybe would have seen something happen you know, a few weeks down the road. We didn't know at the time, well, we missed our chance, but hopefully next time, We'll get uh, uh, we managed to do that. And finally, very recently, let me uh, tell you about sort of the opposite effect. So this is a source called PG5053. And you see here the results from the optical campaign. And if you look at the bottom panel, we see now a rotation in the optical. And from at least the X-ray observation, we have no indication that we see anything changing there. And if you look also at the blue and, and yellow points, which are radio, again, from, from Ivan, they also don't seem to, to change that much. So this time, we, whatever is causing these rotations, we call it midway. So if we were observed just you know, a few weeks before in X-rays, 
what if since something happened there, if we kept observing in, in radio, maybe if I kept observing and it's not telling us, I don't know, uh, maybe there's gonna be something down there. Uh, but just, just so to see that there's really um, uh, a lot that we can be doing with multi-wavelength polarization now in studying those jets. So uh, I thought I told you too many things to summarize in one slide, but uh, I hope I convinced you how polarization is really important for um, the high energy processes in the universe. And uh, I cannot stress how, how excited I am personally, but I think a lot of people in the community that this is, you know, the extra polarization is finally open. And this is a tool that we can use. And as I've already mentioned, this is really just the beginning. We've been now extended for, for uh, 20 more months. And given, given the uniqueness of the mission and our success, I think we will have IXP on the skies for, for many years uh, to come. So of course, there will be certainly many, many more discoveries on the way. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much for the nice uh, talk, uh, Dennis. Is there any question in the room? One there. I among the list of targets that we had, I didn't see a galaxy cluster. Is there a reason why it's not visible or? Well, I'm not. I'm not familiar with what X-ray. So we need the sources to be very bright. Mm -hmm. uh, in x-rays and you know the pointy the source is the better uh, of course as you can see we can do sort of a lot of extended sources uh but that is our limitation xp is a small mission there's way far back go to that list uh so we cannot be you know we try to keep uh, our observations well i wouldn't say short some of them are mega second but in any case, yes, we do need very bright sources for. That's not extended. No, no, we can do extended. It just it's better if it's not like for blazers, for example, is the easiest analysis you can possibly do, uh, right? But I don't know what the level of X-rays in in X-ray clusters. Okay. But if it's ten to the minus eleven, then it's getting very hard. Okay. Another question. Well, thank you very much for it, but it was amazing. But uh, from my ignorance in the, in the subject, is uh, what is the main cause to produce this changing in the in the direction? You mentioned that there are, I mean, when you go to multi wavelength analysis, in some cases you see any, you see it's flat, in other you see. Uh, uh, Evolution as they have changed. What is the real, the physical process? So, um, uh, at the moment, we have two two interpretations. We're not really able to distinguish between what one is that you have a shock that is moving down the jet in sort of a chemical magnetic field. So, as it's spiraling around, we see that variation in the polarization angle, and we see it happen. You know, first in X rays, and then as it moves down, you know, you get lower and lower, lower frequencies. The alternative is a model that has been sort of proposed by um, the, the VLDI people that you have a, two jets in, in a sense. So you have a fast uh, jet that they call the spine, and then you have sort of a sheet outside of that, which is much slower. Mm -hmm. So it could be that the x rays are coming from that spine, whereas the rest is coming from, you know, what's ever surrounding that, that sheet. So we basically sort of see something happening in the x-rays, but we don't really see it translate to optical and radio. That's why I think it's very important to be able to catch them in sequence, mm -hmm. right? So if we're able to you know, get x-rays and then see that it's happening in the optical, mm -hmm. it's probably something moving in the spiral. I mean, I can feel it in the chair. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's very interesting. So you needed some structure for to differentiate between these two explanations. So yeah. in places where you have a lot of gas, for instance, you know, suppose blazer or this kind of galaxies with ADM, 
in the center will be one thing, or maybe in isolated magnet dash, for instance, will be different, isn't it, or not? For the, you mean the changes or this, these two scenarios? Or they, they the so, scenarios work at any, I mean, they are models, they can work to, at any scale or? So in principle, a jet is a jet. You know, and we you know that we've seen in it and different, and that's more or less the same, or is uh... that's what we think that the jets are basically scaling back, and that we don't have a. Uh, it could be there could be differences between the black hole jets and the neutron star jets because the you change you don't have an event horizon in or an atmosphere or things like that in neutron star. So I don't know exactly how how that would would different, but for black hole jets, those should be the same. Thank you. So now, that, now that you have this slide here on the screen, um, well, I was thinking in the talk that you were perhaps a little bit shy on showing the a little bit more information about the impact of the results that have been mm -hmm. uh, published because all of that are archive links. But can you tell just to yeah, give a little bit of an idea about uh, the success of the mission, how many nature science. Ah, I the number. Well, I can tell, okay, so, so I can, one, I can five, yes. tell you that we have, out of all of this, we managed to do, I think, two in MNRAS and two or three in, well, no, maybe maybe six in, in NAPJ levels. Uh, everything else is nature astronomy. <laughs> but that is that, that is sort of I mean these are all completely new results. This is all like I said, it's a new window to the universe. It it was sort of expected that we'll be you know, yeah. doing that one. So no, now you did it. So <laughs> it's, it's really a second school mission, but also because it, it's a, a small NASA mission, so it's so really really cheap. And for yeah. the for the price of the entire mission, it's actually spectacular. The, the impact of the results that it. I mean, I think there was a, a question there. Okay, sorry. So, but, so what about the future? Like, is there plans for a bigger mission like that? Bigger scale? So for the time being, uh, we're getting a, a guest investigator program. So that means that basically everybody can apply for time. And, and do your science with uh, with high speed. There are a few uh, missions that are being proposed at the moment. Uh, nothing is really too far far into because uh, no, I think a lot of people were not even certain that high speed would work. Uh, but everything went well. Really well. There is another. Uh, it's a Chinese led mission called the XTP. Uh, they basically have three. IXP is on, on board. So basically they have a, you know, the, the same detectors exactly, just three times, uh, three times bigger. That is planned to be launched around 2025, 2026. Uh, but, you know, I need to see it really. Uh, but there are definitely, you know, plans for that. There's even plans at the higher energies now that are gonna be um, launched called COSI in 2025, that, that's a go, but, that is in the MEV range and it's not um it I don't from what I, I read, because I'm not involved in that, but from what I read is not that sensitive in, in polarization. Okay. Any final question? If not, so uh, we thank uh, Yanis again. Thank you very much.